What's going on, guys? Welcome back to WWE Network and Show, where I, Graham Jason Matthews, break down all the original content I watch on the WWE Network, on Peacock, and on Vice TV. As today we're talking Season 1, Episode 4 of Tales from the Territory. Uh, this one's called CWF Bloodstains in the Everglades. So, obviously, CWF obviously standing for Championship Wrestling from Florida. On this episode, they had Steve Kern, Kevin Sullivan, Gerald Briscoe. Bob Roop, uh, Bob Roop, excuse me, and Brian Blair as well, who was uh, a familiar face from the Dark Side of the Ring episodes that he was on. He was on many of those throughout season one, maybe not season one, but definitely season two and three. He was on a lot of those episodes. Uh, they talk about how CWF was run by Eddie Graham. They once had Hulk Hogan on the roster at one point. They tell a story about him. A lot of stories about Hogan on these episodes because Hogan went through the territories from CWF to AWA, not necessarily in that order among other territories as well. So they use Hogan's name to kind of carry a lot of these episodes because they don't have Hogan on the show itself, obviously. I don't think Hogan was too happy with how he was uh, portrayed on the show back in season one for the Macho Man stuff, I think, but he probably wouldn't want to do this stuff anyway. But still, the promotion was built on wrestling they talk about and how Eddie kind of turned into a father figure for Steve Kern, who didn't have his father at that point, who uh, went away to the war. So he also bonded with Mike Graham, who was the son of Eddie Graham. So he talks about, Steve Kern does, about learning the sugar hold and how Eddie, during practice, would beat the shit out of people if they just couldn't take it, couldn't take the punishment, whatever. Even if these people ran away to the door and tried to get away, they bolted the door shut and they would beg and plead, please, I don't want to continue, don't beat me up. And then Steve, or not Steve, but rather um, Eddie Graham would beat the fuck out of him anyway. So it's pretty brutal, completely unnecessary, but that's just the way that it was back then. Um, Eddie talks about how he told Roop to stretch a guy who said that wrestling was fake. And Roop was like, listen, he, he told the guy, like he put him in the ring with Roop, and Roop was like, listen, you better get out of here. They want me to kill you. And the guy didn't leave. So he put him in all these holds, and Graham wanted him to break his leg. And he didn't end up breaking his leg, but he could have done a million different holds that would have dislocated his you know, tibia, fibia, ankle, all this other sort of shit that just sounds, ooh, makes me like, you know, just shiver just thinking about it because it's really gross. Uh, but fuck, you know, I mean, still, he didn't uh, do what he told him to do, but still, the guy, you know, that th that's why I don't call wrestling fake back then because that sort of shit happened. So it's uh, pretty fucking brutal. Um, Gerald Briscoe actually remembers seeing Tara Belea, a.k.a. Hulk Hogan, in the crowd one day for one of their shows. Um, well before he got into wrestling, this was actually how he got into wrestling, was attending shows and being a big dude, had this long, flowing, you know, Goldilocks sort of thing. And um, they actually put him in the ring because he really wanted to break into the business. They put him in the ring with Hiro Matsuda. And I remember Hogan telling this story, and Hogan's a very, you know, uh, not-so-reliant storyteller, but I remember reading about this in his book many years ago, and Matsuda actually broke his ankle. I mean, they thought he broke his ankle. He was in pretty serious pain. He groaned, didn't, like, yell out or anything, but, like, you heard a pop or a crack or whatever, and he couldn't put any weight on his ankle, so Hogan leaves. And turns out nothing was broken. Hogan comes back. Hogan comes back, and they were really surprised. They thought that he was a goner. They thought that he was done, but they realized when he came back that he was not a quitter. And they kind of question how different would the wrestling business be if he did quit and did not come back, which is a great question to ponder. So Kern also talks about going back to his dad, how his dad was a prisoner in war in World War II. And he went from Russia to Vietnam when the Vietnam War broke out, all this other sort of stuff. He was gone for, I think, seven to eight years. Um, Eddie Graham really wanted Kern to break into wrestling. But Kern said, no, I'm going to finish college first. That's what my dad probably would want, what my mom definitely wants. And he said that the only thing that he got accomplished in college, the only thing he learned, was how to take steroids. I, I assume that affected his wrestling career as well. They don't really go back to that, but that's what he said here. So, interesting comment. But he finished college, I guess. And sure enough, Eddie really wanted him to break into wrestling. He was a bigger guy coming out of college, put on a lot of weight. So that's exactly what he did. He actually trained with uh, Hiro Matsuda, and he, he talks about that. So his dad comes home, ultimately, from the war when he's 21, and when, when uh, Kern is 21, and I guess according to one of the clips they showed here, it was on the same night as Steve Kern's first match. Now, Kern did not say that. That was just according to the clip they showed from back then. So I don't know if that's accurate or not. But either way, he came back. So, like, they're driving. He recalls the whole process. This was awesome. I thought Kern was the best part of this episode. He recalls the entire experience when they drive up to the plane, and anyone who was there, a prisoner of war, the longest, would be the first plane out back to the States. And 
Um, his dad was on that plane. So he was told by the press or whoever, like, listen, when he comes out, you see him, run up to him, shake his hand, give him a hug, hold the door open for your mom, blah, blah, blah. Because the media want that great shot, that great video, so they could put it in the paper and all this other sort of stuff. And he's like, okay. As soon as he saw his daddy, he went ballistic. And like, not just over the top, showing off, whatever, like acting emotional. He really was emotional, not having seen his dad for eight years. He fucking ran up to the guy, picked him up because he had gotten so strong from wrestling. And his dad's like, put me down so I could walk. But he was really emotional. And it was all that pent up, uh, you know, emotion and passion that he had had for his father in the eight years he was gone. So I thought that was a really cool story. Um, So Kern really wanted his feud around that point with uh, Bob Roop to get personal. And it was his idea to incorporate some real history into it because they wanted to bring in the whole dad thing. Roop used to be a serviceman, he said. Um, He did serve in one of the wars or did something for three years. So Roop's whole line that they replayed here was that, oh, you know, as someone who was in the service at one point, anyone that was a prisoner of war, I see as a disgrace. And it was such a great line, and they talk about how they wouldn't be able to get away with it today. Eddie Graham, they knew, would not approve of this, but he was away in Australia for like, like a couple of months. So he went to his dad, Steve did, and said, hey, would you be okay with this? He said, yeah. Roop thought it was great, cuts the whole promo, and uh, they, got two, they got two months out of it. They got two months out of the angle, and it was so heated that Roop recalls, like, he, he wouldn't leave his house other than for shows. Like, he told his girlfriend that he heard people talking, I guess she was a waitress or something, she would hear people talk about how people legitimately wanted to kill fucking Bob Roop. And he told this story about how, I guess he was leaving a show one day or whatever, getting into his car. This guy wearing a military jacket pulled a gun on him. And obviously he was offended by what he was saying in his promo, thinking it was real. Pulls a gun on him. He legitimately thought he was going to die. He was terrified, but knowing that he had to keep kayfabe, he didn't beg, didn't cry, didn't plead, whatever. He just turned around and walked away. Thinking, okay, if this guy's from the military, he would do the honorable thing and not shoot me in the back as I'm walking away. And thankfully he didn't, but he was absolutely terrified from that point forward. It really instilled a lot of fear in him. So I thought that was a very interesting story as well. They talk about Kevin Sullivan, who was on this episode as well. You could barely, you barely hear from the guy, but he talks about his whole angle about turning evil and how he recruits Mark Lewin and Roop himself to the army of darkness and shaving their heads and all this other sort of stuff. He lived the gimmick uh, Dusty Rhodes really helped with the booking of said angle, um, in addition to Graham over the, uh, you know, you know, kind of the overall territory and booking that angle specifically. Um, and they tell the story about Blackjack Mulligan and Sullivan having this one week fight. That's what it was called. And they fought like one night, disappeared under the crowd, and they came back the following week wearing the same clothes during the second match, which is such a great idea. And we very rarely see that now, but especially back then when people thought it was real, I think that's a great idea. Um, that was really cool as well. Um, Steve, or who was it? Um, Briscoe. Briscoe, or was it Kern? No, no, Brian Blair. I'm sorry. Brian Blair uh, tells the story about how Pat Patterson was known for ribbing. And he was out with the Briscoes one night, and they turn over, and they see Pat Patterson in his car with his boyfriend. And they mooned, or maybe Pat did, or his boyfriend, I don't remember. They mooned the Briscoes and, um, and Blair. So the Briscoes told Blair, listen, we got to get back at him. So they planned to have Blair moon Patterson. Little did Blair know he pulled down his pants when the car door opened, whatever, when the, when the trunk opened. He was sitting in there. He's like, oh, I can breathe, but I, you know, are we there yet? Blah, blah, blah. So he's like whining and whatever. They pop open the trunk, has his ass sticking out, and he moons, not, the, not Patterson, but rather this entire restaurant. They were ribbing Blair. And he falls out, his pants are on his ankles, they drive away, he's stuck there, called in the most embarrassing moment of his entire life. I thought that was a really funny story as well. Um, As they wind down, they talk about Eddie Graham himself and how he was a recovering alcoholic at the time. He was 13 years sober, but when he was drunk, he was a really nasty drunk. So they were taking the plane back to Florida or some place in Florida to another part of Florida, I don't remember, but Eddie was the pilot. And he was supposed to call the tower, buckle up, whatever. He didn't do any of that. He got back on the plane from being at the bar, fucking raging alcoholic at this point. He he obviously broke his sobriety, really, really drunk. And it got so bad that he drove right in to the Disney World firework display. Like that they do every night at Disney World. I was actually just at Disneyland recently. They They do indeed still do that. And he drove right into it. And, um, I think it was Blair or Kern, I think. Kern was on that was on that plane and he was telling the story. He thought they were going to die. He thought the plane was going to blow up. 
Thankfully, they did not. Um, they actually almost had another airliner on the runway, and he got out of the way at the last second, and they almost crashed into the police arrived. It's this whole crazy scene. Before he could put the steps out of the of the exit door, he just falls out of the exit door because, again, he's still super drunk. Falls right out of the runway. His pants split. Super embarrassing. The police actually went to his aid because I guess they recognized him. And Graham was like, oh, I thought I just got hit over the head with a chair, and I was in this match with Croc or Killer Croc, which is a fucking Spider-Man villain, I think. But he said something like that, I guess. And Curran just couldn't believe that these policemen were, like, kind of just letting him off the hook because they knew who he was. He was, like, this local celebrity in Florida, Florida, whatever, uh, having run the territory. So he thought that was crazy. Uh, From that point forward, though, he just kind of lost everyone. He lost the Briscoes. He lost all of his talent. Um, The territory just kind of died. And um, I don't think they mention it here. He did lose his life. I think he killed himself by suicide. Um, by I think shooting himself, I don't know at what point, how many years after this, but I don't know if they said the word suicide here, but I know that's how he died. Um, as did Mike Graham, I believe his son and a few other members of that family. So pretty, a lot of tragic losses in that family. But on a positive note, uh, Briscoe says that, you know, all of them passed along the knowledge they got from, you know, Eddie Graham to other territories that they went to. And Curran actually started running FCW when he joined WWE, and Vince asked him where he wanted the developmental program. He said Florida, and they called it FCW, Florida Championship Wrestling, uh, which is pretty cool. So a nice kind of a full full circle moment there. But a good episode, though. I thought this was good stuff. Um, This was CWF Bloodstains and the Everglades. Uh, Not the most flashiest, not not the flashiest episode we've had yet. Not, Not a lot of notable names on this one, but... Um, I thought they all had some good stories. Honestly, probably the most engaging. A lot of easy-to-follow stories, some entertaining stories. Uh, No one, really, all not a lot of people anyway on the actual panel, come away looking bad. Because like some of the other episodes, they tell these stories, and it's like, well, these people are fucking dicks for doing this, and they're laughing about it. But no one on this panel, for the most part, looks entirely bad. Um, A lot of harmless stories. But it was entertaining, though. It was uh, the successful promotion, telling the story about it. Rise, fall, talent they had there, stuff like that. So... Good stuff from Tales from the Territory, another very enjoyable edition. I know the latest episode aired this past week, so I'm hoping to watch that and catch up and get back on schedule in the next few days, so keep an eye out for that. Until then, guys, have an awesome one. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.